Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Creatives Ignite. And I am excited because last time that I did this with Amaryllis, it was Design Recharge. So we, we, me and my dog have rebranded and we are now uh, Creatives Ignite all the time. So Amaryllis was one of our camp speakers back in 2021. She was awesome. She has done so much. She kind of wrapped up. She wrote me an email with the things that all the things that she's done. So you may have remember her that she's a Skillshare teacher and one of the top Skillshare teachers. That's how I found her. I was, um, I watched all her things. She's an author, which I have her books back here. I should have probably pulled them out so that I could prove. I am a pre-order. When she says it's coming, I pre-order. So I love that. Um, but she, and I had said in the pr- uh, promo, there were like five things. There are way more than five, but the five things that I love um, is that you? Your faith is at the center of your work. You watercolor devote devo is your handle everywhere, and I'll share that in a little bit. Um, and then that's you were just doing your devotionals, and you were illustrating. You were an illustrator. Your mom was an illustrator. Um, that you are always trying something new. You have multiple income streams, which I think is really important for us not to have everything in one basket. Which hopefully all of us learned in 2020. Um, but the other thing is that you don't give up, that you're always exploring, or it seems like you're always exploring and experimenting, but you take us on um, the journey with you. And then you share what you know. You're easy to talk to and relate to. And those are some of the things that I love about you. So I'm really excited. You're always teaching me something on Skillshare or on in your community. So I'm sure I left some things out. Do you want to fill it in on anything? Please. <laughs> Gee whiz. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you from where you were in the past to where you are now you had you've been on the show and you talked about surtex ter, surtex and then since then you went to blueprint and surtex again right mm-hmm. surtex surtex with an tex, s with like textiles i guess yeah. Right? yeah surface design and textiles there you go perfect okay so Tell them, um, because then you've had, I think, multiple books come out since then. I've I've written, uh, authored two books and have illustrated two books. At least. Yes. Okay. (laughs) I'll make sure I grow grab them. (laughs) I don't know if my thing's long enough right this second, but I'll I'll get to it. So you were on the last time. You'd been on before multiple times, but... This is um, in 2017. So from 2017, you kind of wrote up some things and I had I printed it out because I was like, hmm, okay. So you want to, um, do you want me to read these or do you want to? You know, I mean, what's funny is I don't remember what I wrote. I just remember we had kind of a practice call and we talked about all the things, maybe not so much about what we would talk about today. So I was like, you know what, let me just, throw a bunch of bullet points at you bullet points is how i email and i i threw out a lot of things that have happened since about that time okay so I, right yeah so i'm gonna read them and then if there's something that you want to um i'll ask you about them later i guess so 30 skillshare classes total you were on skillshare i think one of the first teachers that i can it's uh 2016. 2016. Okay. So then you have two how-to books, Expressive Little Phrases and Expressive Little Animals, which I have both of them right over there. Um, two illustrated children's books, God's pr- ch- uh, God's Christmas Promise pop-up book, and I'm a Little Lady. So those you didn't write, you just illustrated? Right. Okay. Correct. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about that. So was that through, um, did they find you through uh, agent or through one of these shows or do you? Re- so uh, the, the illustrated books, um, is that what you're asking about? Yeah. 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 So God's Christmas promise was a pop-up lighted book, which I have behind me here. And it was done with day spring, which is the uh, faith division of homework. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I've done work with them before for surface design, but uh, this was my first illustrated book with them, and it's a gift book. The, Have you ever done the, a pop-up? 
No. So technically it was a little challenging because, you know, it's a good thing, I think, in Photoshop layers, because that's essentially what we have here. Each little panel is a layer and they all need to cut out and carve into each other a little bit. So um, it was kind of challenging to make sure that, you know, one angel's hand wasn't slapping another behind him or, you know, the the donkey wasn't covering someone up or, you know, whatever, that kind of a thing. But it was, it was, it's got, I mean, it's one of my favorite projects, but the way I met them was so long ago. It was when, when I was with an agency. So I differentiate having an agent with being with an agency. Having an agent means you're part of maybe, I don't know, 50 or less, three dozen artists that they represent. An agency I say that because I, uh, it was a large, large um, site that represented artists. Uh, so I was one of hundreds of artists. And so I connected with Dayspring then. They basically just show your portfolio. It's kind of like I stock photo for art licensing. And I never, I never really developed a relationship with them. They just saw something that they liked and we moved forward and and then uh, over time, I actually left the agency and I had to take a year off from a, just a cooling off period. Uh, if I broke the contract, I had to just kind of keep quiet for a bit, built up the portfolio and then went looking for them again. But really, I reconnected with them at Surtex in person. And that's when um, we had talked about a lot of different things. And a month or two later, we started talking about this book. So what started out as a gift line and greeting cards, a calendar, and over the years became this book uh, for their, yeah, for their line of, of gift books for Christmas. I think it's still available if you look it up. Cool. Okay. So then um, you launched a spoon flower shop, which we'll tell people about just in case they don't know what that is, but that's pretty big. Like you have fabric over there behind you. You have new, yeah. like you have, I can't even remember what the bolts they're called bolts, right? Bolts of fabric yes. behind you whole yeah. bolts, but then you've also done a gift wrap. There's been, um, other things. So, but spoon flower does more than just fabric. I, they may have started mm -hmm. with fabric. I believe they're in North Carolina. Um, mm -hmm. But now they do lots of things and I went on there and I, uh, I think it's cool. It's, I'm going to ask you a couple questions about that. So that's interesting. And that's kind of on your own. Um, it's not so like what you did with day spring, um, you pulled out, you have that year off, you can't work for them or it would break the contract that you had with the agency usually is how those work or you have some sort of time frame. Um, so then spoon flower I could buy a bolt of fabric of yours if I wanted to right today. Right. Yeah. Because. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So what are um, you about? Then? <laughs> I know, I know. I, um, I could I, do that. I could, I should do that. Um, yeah. So then you did spring trade shows, which I think some of them went online for during COVID. And I wasn't sure if you had any, but I wanted to hear kind of your insights, which I'll get to. I'm just, Finishing this list. So Surtex in Surtex. I don't know why I call it wrong. Anyway, whatever. They're not watching. 2018 and then Blueprint, which is another one in mm -hmm. 2019. It's just a different. It's like when I looked, Surtex was $3,000 and Blueprint was $2,000. So it didn't look like it was that much of a difference in price, really. But <clears throat> I don't know where Blueprint was. Where was that one? Uh, it was different every year, just basically checking out different warehouses and or banquet halls. So um, I can't tell you where it was. I'm not that familiar with New York. I would just kind of no, but it was New York. <laughs> that, that's that's all. That's all. I, uh, I didn't know if it was like in Portland or, you know, another location. OK, so it's in New York. And now um, you you did go to the recently you went to the Atlanta Mart. Gift Mart. Gift mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew because I grew up in Atlanta. So I not that I ever went, but I did hear you hear about those things, I guess. Um, and then you've spoken at Alt Summit in 2020 and you went back to SCAD and you spoke in 2023, which was, it, I guess, just last month. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and then watercolor bowl is the membership that you started. So in, now you have this ongoing, you're teaching things on a regular basis. And I love that. I've been in it since it began. Um, the artist pro method is an annual course that you've offered in the spring was, is it always in the spring? Yes. It'll, it'll ramp up, uh, April 1st. Uh, okay, next. cool. Okay. You don't ever worry about doing something on April 1st. No, it's April fool's. Day. Okay. Hey, we're launching for real. Okay. So you ran it in 2021, 2022, and then April 1st, 2023, and then lots of licensing. And you gave me lots of, uh, picolage. I don't know how to say that. Picolage, pick collage. Yes, okay, yeah. <laughs> in the South picolage. I don't know. Papyrus design house greetings and Trader Joe's. So you have some cards and trade, which those look like they're sort of poppy uppy also. Well, sometimes, yeah, the, they are textured or the papyrus does more embellishments and Trader Joe's does. Now what they're doing more is the art on the inside of the card, which is so fun to continue in that artwork. But that's yeah. cool. And then you launched a YouTube channel, which I was really excited for. And I actually tagged you in one of the my posts today on YouTube. I was like, oh, because now I can tag you from the anyway. I, nobody's seen it. So you guys should go to YouTube and check it out. But I will share all these. You hadn't sent me the YouTube, but I went ahead and grabbed it. So I have it to share. Um, so now I'm going to dive into some of these questions. What is the biggest change? And you gave me two, like teaching and then um in art licensing, but when you wrote these uh, ideas down, but what is the thing that's changed the most since 2017? I, I mean, in general, I would say that I've really gotten a lot clearer on what I have to serve. Skillshare has been a great place for me to throw out classes that are just like, Hey, I'm excited about this. Let me show you. Hey, I'm excited about this. Let me show you. And and there wasn't necessarily a lot of continuity or strategy, uh, just a lot of heart. And through that, I learned what it was that people were reacting to the most and what it was that people needed the most in, in terms of teaching watercolor. Uh, so I would say that that helped me understand then when I created Watercolor Bold, the heart of bold is is that like the the approach to the paper to jump in and to experiment and you know you hear this all the time do it for the process trust the process do it um yeah do it for the fun of it have fun people can see the joy in your work but how do you actually approach the page and do that consistently and also grow in skill not just tutorial based right. how to paint the pig step by step and now my pig looks exactly like yours. And, you know, there's there's like a, a loss of a sense of pride in that. So I was excited to kind of take those things that I learned and create my own thing. With art licensing, I would say it was a very similar process. When I started in art licensing, I was so aware of what's cool. What do people like? I'd go to the store and pick something up and be like, oh, I could have done that and get frustrated. But that's not what it's all about. It's, it's that that person did that cactus repeat and that's their thing. That's they, they brought their own style, their own flavor to it. And as I've grown as an artist and in knowing myself altogether, I have felt so much freedom in creating whatever I want and making that my portfolio whatever you put into your portfolio, whatever you show the world that you create, you're just going to generate more work like that. And so at first where I was mimicking what I thought people wanted, hmm. I ended up getting those jobs, but it wasn't what I wanted. It was more of what I think people want instead of living the lifestyle that I wanted to have of creating artwork and enjoying it <laughs> and, and then getting paid for it. I mean, that's the dream, right? Yeah. So I would say that that's been the biggest difference. You went through a lot of like the concrete steps that I sent you, a lot of the, you know, highlights of, of the last few years. But I think it comes down to a honing in on what it is that I call my craft, what I have to serve with and taking on that, that attitude of service instead of 
boasting and copying and trying to be cool. And it's so much more fun and so much more rewarding because uh, there's so much you gain by being genuine online because there's just not a ton of that going around. Yeah. Well, it feels like uh, you're equipping the people who are taking your classes with skills that they can use in other things instead of just replicating exactly what this thing is, which I think, you know, sometimes in the beginning when we're learning, we do need to replicate. <laughs> I still need to work on my flowers, but, um, but like there's, there's something about serving in that way. And it's really equipping me with, you know, I can give you a fish or I can teach you to fish and you're teaching me to fish <laughs> that way, I think. Okay. Cool. So, um, what do you think is has been maybe it's a mindset or a, a big hurdle that you had to get over um, in this time period in regards to your business? Well, like anyone else who would talk about the last five years, COVID was a thing and it affected everything. Um, I, I found myself with less time, right? We're always feeling time deprived, but I was also needing to uh, teach my kids through their online learning because yeah, that's just not enough <laughs> for kids. Uh, it was fun actually looking back kind of created our little COVID bubble of families where we kind of created a bit of a homeschool co-op where someone would teach some, some subject and I would teach another subject and we'd rotate the kids around with it in our neighborhood in, among our houses. Um, so that was fun. But I would say that, uh, with COVID, the obstacle there was, I think everyone had a bit of a reckoning of what am I doing with my life? You know, it was yeah. like everything hit pause and then you had a minute to think. And so during COVID, I focused on um, a small group, about a dozen women that I would just paint, throw on the camera, talk through my process and that became kind of the crucible before starting the membership of what was helping them and, and what my discoveries were, even as I painted. So that was one, uh, just the, the isolation, the pause, and then kind of regrouping. Uh, financially, it also, you know, had that dip. So that was an obstacle where I'm thinking, do, you, do I want to go back to the way I was doing things? and regain whatever loss I felt I had, or do I want to start over? So um, just really believing or trusting in yourself and the process and in the path that you're on was one thing. And I think another obstacle, and maybe that I'm not sure if, yeah, it counts as one. It just, it, it sounds odd. The whole getting yourself out there I have not been camera shy necessarily, especially when I'm actually sitting by myself at my desk and nobody's around anyway. <laughs> so it's not that scary. I'm just talking to a camera. Uh, but then when things started to open up, I started doing in-person classes and uh, receiving speaking engagements. And I just was like, okay, I, I, I took on a, all right, let's try this attitude. And it's it's worlds away from the hermit of a girl that I was growing up. Uh, I moved around a lot, so I had to learn how to make friends. And that helped a lot in my, I don't know, social, social anxiety. But I have a very uh, outgoing husband. So a lot of times I'll just kind of, you know, shrink behind him, let him do the talking. And at these last few events, I'm flying somewhere and by myself. And I got to put, you know, my big girl shoes on and, you know, present uh, over and over and over again. And that's been, that's been fun, but it's, it's been a challenge because going from being really dormant during those COVID years to suddenly everybody's bananas about seeing each other, then that's been something that I've, I don't know, I've enjoyed seeing that like, yes, I can do it. And I, I really have learned that the difference is just, if I feel tired today, I'm just going to feel tired today. And I'm just going to be that. And I, if I feel energetic, 
That's what you're going to get today. And it's the pretending that's really exhausting Mm -hmm. and the expectation of whatever vision we think we ought to be that makes it intimidating. So once I let those two go, it's been fun to just show up as myself and, and move past a lot of that introversion that I think we're tempted to a lot as creatives. Yeah. Well, I love that. So in these five years, you had some of that already in figuring out, hey, I don't I won't, don't want to just paint llamas or if this isn't what I want to paint or this particular thing or this particular style. Yes, I can do it. But you started embracing who you were as an artist and what you wanted to create. And as a result of that, you are getting more of the work that you want and you're um, you're out in different places, but you're you're putting your your spin on it and you kind of like. Uh, I do feel like there's in the beginning, we're just trying to get seen and found and we're ready. Mm -hmm. Um, I always Mm -hmm. tell my husband, I'm like, I will never get married again. When you die, this is it, you know, like, (laughs) um, but I can't imagine going back out there and being dating because I'm just like, oh, and that's what I think of when I think about clients. I think I don't want to have a whole bunch of first dates over and over and over. I want to have some long term (laughs) clients, you know, I want to have long relationships because it is that it can be very um it's full of rejection and you have to be okay with that and Mm -hmm. but I don't want people to just tell me oh that's great and then never you know I want to get better so that's something that um I think you've found that piece and now you actually are helping people figure that out on their own as well which I love Um, I think it's important to remember though that you will you'll never stop pitching like you'll never stop dating around if I'm going to like continue the analogy (laughs) just because um I see now I like I am so addicted to metaphors that now I'm like because one isn't gonna fulfill you completely you have to that's terrible it's terrible um but one friend might not be able to fulfill you so if you're you know like okay so we'll friend yeah (laughs) (laughs) friend dating uh but yeah, I, I, I had this idea that if I reached a certain point uh, in the hustle, that then the clients are going to start coming to me and I don't have to do this anymore. To some extent, you do that less, but you will always be pitching because the people that will come to you will often be not people that you were necessarily pining for. And so when we have a dream, it really is like, a collection of thousands of dreams that are tiny steps. Right. And then once you, once you realize what those are, then you go after them and more start opening up as things that you want. And as you grow, that's not a bad thing. But I think it's different when you're pitching and you're just trying to date anybody, you'll take anybody, anybody, will you go on a (laughs) date with me as opposed to where you'll, you'll do whatever they want to do. And, Mm -hmm. and now you're being you and you still are having to pitch, but it's easier if they don't like it. It's fine. You really do like it. And there, you know, there are people who do like it as well. I guess there's something with experience and, um, uh, time and just like being confident in, in what you're doing. I I guess I, obviously I was a very desperate dater um is what it sounds like um but that I remember when I started dating my husband and I was like look you're getting the real me I don't want to do this or I don't you know like this is what I like to do and I know that he loves me for the all the weirdness that I am because I didn't try to be somebody else and I guess that's what I'm thinking as an artist it's really hard because you're you aren't really sure if somebody's going to like that illustration style or that drawing because you don't see it out there at all. But really, right. and I've see, heard a lot of people recently, um, maybe it's just old videos and I'm just finally getting to them, but they've said, you know, I was doing this kind of work because that was what was selling. But then somebody looked at my sketchbook and they wanted me to do this work, sketchbook work. And they were like, what? This is what I do for fun. I didn't think anybody would pay me, but that's where I guess it's developing a style and developing what what marks you make in a regular when you're not trying to do something for any and 
uh, I was watching one of your classes again last night and it's called playground. It's on Skillshare. Um, and it really is just like making messes and making marks. And you realize you tend to make certain marks when you're just being you, when you're not trying to solve a, a brief for a client or not that it's bad to, to have the briefs to solve for the client, but um, sometimes it's just good to figure out what you like to make and what your style is. Not that you aren't going to continue to grow and evolve. Anyway, just trying to explain about the dating thing. Um, okay. So in, in this, in this playground one, I think is a great example of this next question, um, a creative challenge. What has been um, that class is great for not having uh, expectations and kind of figuring out what your style is having that playground. I love that class, but um, what's the biggest creative challenge in these five years? It doesn't have to just be in COVID, but what's been a challenge for you since 2017 creatively? I think as artists or creatives, whichever you identify with uh, designers, we are always into the next thing. You know, you're wanting to shift gears and change things up. And well, what if I try this? And what about that? And what I've done, I made a little deal with myself since the beginning is I was going to just do any subject matter I felt like, but like the one thread that I have is watercolor. And so I actually enjoy a lot of other mediums, but I will only you know, walk that out so far. I'll combine it with watercolor. Uh, I, I tried iPad art. I was just like, this just is not textural enough for me. And all I, I mean, to add textures, I'm like just doing this over and over again with different layers and different brushes. And it's, I feel like with watercolor, you just kind of go whoop and then wait to see what turns out <laughs> in terms of texture. But at times it, it is, creatively difficult to stick to the same thing. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, when I get bored, so to speak with be it the medium or, or the things that are popular right now, I just have to shift it just a little bit and it'll be interesting enough for me to just work that out. So it could be changing the brand of paint that I use. It could be a new set of brushes uh, it could be uh, just really like you were saying at the beginning of learning anything like mimicry is part of the process. I'll look at someone's art and say, OK, their art is different from mine. That's cool. Why do I like it? Mm. And to get really nitty gritty about it in order to, to translate it into how I work. Uh, and if nothing else, then mimicking it and then not showing anybody and definitely not putting it in my portfolio and just calling it a practice so that I could try on a different style for a minute. I'd say that that creatively is just a challenge I think we have throughout of not feeling bored. And yet, I mean, we know that there's more. On the other side of that is hitting that ceiling of I keep doing the same thing. And so you're not bored in terms of like, I don't know what, what you feel like some constraints you're bored with yourself. That's probably like the worst. Um, and that's actually when I started doing watercolor playgrounds. So for those who haven't seen it, it's essentially um, the work that I would have right next to the commission work that I'd be working on. And while I'm waiting for things to dry, because, you know, with watercolor, it's so easy to keep meddling and working. Right. Really, gotta let that layer dry. Just let it be. And so I work on several pieces at a time. And so I started working on what I called growth boards because I would just write the word grow. So I was like, I don't know where this is going. And they and, were pretty big. Yes, they were. They were those um, canvas panels, which aren't awesome for watercolor. I, no matter how many layers of watercolor gesso they put on that, it just doesn't soak the way a paper does. But they were they were really layerable. So it was just something nice to have on the side and to be able to mess with. Whereas with a sheet of paper, then I feel like we need to finish this 9 by 12, 8 by 10 space. 
And so I was, I was bored with how I was creating, uh, I was still getting paid for it. So I was still doing the work and side by side. I was also doing whatever I could think of, even if I thought it was going to be ugly. And that's when I started to discover what it is to play intuitively. I never did um, non-objective or abstract things before uh, doing these playgrounds. And that's why I called them that because I would just, that was like my, 11 by 16 space to play in with watercolor. And it was essentially, it's always the same process, right? You start off with like a mess and then you, you try to reel it in a little bit, create some shapes and make some bodies of things. And you start noticing this is kind of a patch that I could do this little pattern in, or let's bring out some more details here. Let's take out the markers and work on top of that. And, and as I realized what I was doing, it kind of became this pretty straightforward path of, oh, okay, those are the steps. Now I know how to do this when I need to just break that ceiling. The next spring, I was doing a, a blueprint, I believe. Yeah, blueprint uh, trade show. And you come with these huge 11 by 17 printouts of your artwork. And it sounds like a bit like an ocean where people are, art directors are coming by. It's like if you imagine a craft show, except your merchandise is your art. So they are swooping from one page to another, flipping, and then they'll say, we like this one, pull this one out. And you create a little stack for that client, get their email address and then a PDF for them to further review with their team. And I needed more merchandise. So I started scanning those those paintings I didn't really think that they would work maybe as like you know if they were blown out like on a background of a notebook you know something really fun and splashy I was really surprised that they were hit and the companies that were interested in them were like greeting cards that were fairly literal and fabric which I would not think to repeat you know you think of little floral Mm -hmm. motifs or, you know, just deer, reindeer. I don't know. Like you think of like icons uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to gift wrap and, and fabric. But they look at these pieces that, you know, sometimes a face would pop up in one. And, and a lot of times the surface design that just kind of rolls it out right there. But uh, they, they had a different essence to them, like you were saying, and, and they were noticed. And so that's how I felt that I realized not only like did banging up against the wall and feeling like I wasn't growing turn into growth, but it actually turned the corner on the kind of artwork that I was creating and artwork that I would enjoy. So whenever I feel myself hit the ceiling again <laughs> with here I go again with this same thing, uh, I, I remind myself because I've had this experience that there's something on the other side of this and I absolutely have to push through it. If I, if I get bored with myself and with my own work, um, I'm really going to be in trouble. So I have to push through it because you have to be your greatest advocate. So how am I going to get excited for my work again? I'm going to have to figure out a way to enjoy it again. And then the quality of the work will follow. That's cool. That's a really uh, insightful. And I love that you maybe didn't have the expectations of it because it didn't fit what you thought um, this would be for a textile pattern or for a repeat. It wasn't. And this is where I think when we go somewhere and we show our work um, to somebody who is in the business and knows it backwards and forwards, isn't making art. They are seeing what things and they see something that's going to be different and they see something in this that they are not seeing because everybody is trying to do these clear repeats or right. Anyway, I just, I love that. And that's a super gives me hope. That's a really hopeful um, thing. Okay. So this might be a super stupid question, um, but I like it as it goes with what you have to be your I love stupid advocate. Okay. Easy. Well, Okay, well, here's the, I think I know the answer. You're a mom and you have a business and you have a husband. And anyway, do you struggle with time management? 
Hmm. Yeah. But just like normal people. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Okay. So then um, you just talked about this, about being your biggest advocate. This is one uh, area that I struggle with. Um, So marketing yourself. um, Have you ever struggled with that? Like just putting and having to sell your thing over and over. You're like, oh my gosh, these people are going to unsubscribe because I'm telling them about my community again this week. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. How, how do you get over that? I, I think we feel awkward because we are putting like, it's, it's like, we think we're elevating ourselves and going, here I am, here I am. Everybody look at me, check this out, please, please, please. But, and, and that is, it doesn't, that smells foul. Like nobody wants to look at that guy. Um, that but, is what it feels like. <laughs> Uh, what, what I have found to be the difference is I, I listen to the, this sounds so dumb. I listen to the people that like me a lot because I need their, their voice in my head. For one, it made me feel more comfortable that, okay, I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you, Shelly. You're a fan. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you, Diane. Like I'm going to pretend that I'm talking to you and only you. So that's one part of it. But another aspect was uh, when people comment on your work and the things that they notice and they like, like how often are you just genuinely surprised at what they pick up on? Because you, your mind was somewhere else or you were maybe going straight to the negative of, yeah, but have you seen this train wreck of a spot over here? But they are not. They are looking at overall or they resonated with something. And so the more that I put on this attitude of I'm going to talk to that person and I'm going to try to help them in some way. I I send out weekly emails called tip Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. The reason why I send out weekly emails is because I started monthly and then I just forget and uh, I just felt guilty for not doing the thing. And then it felt just awkward. Do I just say, Hey, it's me again. (laughs) So I, I literally just had to make myself do it weekly. I wanted it to be like a memorable, you know, thing for me and, and whoever would be receiving it. So in those tip Tuesdays, uh, unlike, so part of the tension is I didn't want to be a tutorial girl where it's like, learn how to do this three steps to do that. Now we're going to do this because it's really exhausting and it's not connection. Like, yes, you, you do get to show somebody how to do something. And there's a connection in that they get a win and you are part of that win. Like, that is great. But on a regular basis, I just don't want what I do to be only like, well, what are we going to do next? And what are you going to teach me? And how, how do I do this? You know, like I. Very I passive to- from the, from the participant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I want to actually connect. And so, um, I, I. I call them tip Tuesdays, but we don't always, sometimes the tip isn't, you know, sometimes it is a tutorial. Sometimes it's, I figured out how to use this brush in a different way. Check it out. Uh, Making palm trees with a flat brush is so fun. You should try it sometime. Or maybe it's uh, kind of tackling those limiting beliefs that we all have and trying to flip them on their heads. Uh, those are the ones that actually get the most responses from because, you know, it's it's hitting a chord somewhere. And yet I feel a little awkward because I'm like, I'm no coach or counselor or whatever title I'm supposed to have. But it's just what I'm sharing today. It's just my tip. Like, take it or leave it. Doesn't matter if you like it or not. Um, but the uh, the time management is that the original question? Is that what we were talking it was about? Both. It was, uh, do you struggle with time management? And then the next part of that question was, do you struggle with marketing yourself? Oh, marketing. Thank you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Marketing. That's You're like, right. I got time management. Yes. Um, I have a problem with that. The end. Go to the next question. That's okay. what <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically shifting the focus off yourself, even though in the end, you're directing them to something that you've done. It's, it's, it's just like, I mean, we do that in conversation all the time, right? Maybe I want to tell you about my vacation. So I ask you, so how was, how was your weekend? And really I'm like eager to tell you about my weekend and, 
when I tell you about my weekend, it reminds you of your weekend and back in October when you went to that same place. And that's how you get the conversation going. So with the marketing, mm-hmm. yes, I am constantly not thinking about what it is that I have that, oh, I, I think you should check this out. Will you please? But not thinking about the thing, but thinking about the person that I'm talking to. I can say that with time management, um, having the tip Tuesdays puts me in a mindset of like talking to my audience, so to speak. And so that helps me clump together other tasks that are similar. So I'll start cleaning out the email list. I'll look at the website. I'll do social media. And so what I've found is that I kind of have this rhythm throughout the week where uh, if Tuesday and Wednesday tend to be more marketing email focused, Monday um, tends to be my core work, like that, that big project, that thing, because on the weekend I don't work. And so when it comes to Monday, I'm like ready for that thing I want to tackle. And then I shift into kind of that, conversing with customers and clients and Thursday I'm like forget the computer I'm going to my art desk I just want to create today Friday's kind of a catch-all day we we just see how it goes uh it's usually all the things that didn't get done during the week and that could be in anything but um like it could still be taxes it could still be taxes (laughs) <laughs> uh, don't even get me started that's what i was working on before we got on today but i'm working on it it's spring break you know gotta do the fun stuff during oh. break. anyway it's good so when you're um struggling with being sick of whatever watercolor that you have how do you go about um finding or searching new um, brushes or new brands of watercolor or like how do you go about learning new ways or new skills or new ways to even if it's like your email right like I think me and you both use the same email thingy mm-hmm. still um, mm-hmm. and or whatever they're, they're called anyway sounds not very professional I can't even remember I mean I know no, either email provide whatever yes um but it's like how do you go about finding something uh like when you decided like when did you decide to go do youtube like i mean youtube's been around but when did you like start a youtube what was it because that's a new skill to some extent right yeah yeah i you know sadly i i think of doing things for months and years and then one day i'm just like I got to do that thing as if I had not ever thought about it. I don't think I really have a very professional process in that sense, but uh, it just was one of those moments where I'm like, what am I doing? Like I do video. Why am I not on YouTube? Well, I think of my kids watching YouTube and I, I talk about about YouTubers a lot, actually. (laughs) (laughs) I don't, I don't want to be one of them, but you know, obviously like that's the medium. That's what I do. Why am I not on there? And uh, then I started, I think it's the community uh, meeting other artists and hearing about, Hey, I'm trying this out. And so I've, I have a network of people around me that are all doing something different. And so really the, the limitation or the limitation I have to put on myself is to not do all the things because, Ooh, that sounds like fun. And Ooh, that sounds like a good idea. But, um, I, I'm around a lot of, I just chat, I chat with a lot of uh, other artists and women that's mostly women, all women (laughs) who really work at growing and we feed off each other. Um, I don't think it was necessarily like an intentional move, but it's been a huge shift. And again, like going online so much uh, as in terms of our relationships um, has made that be more prominent for me where I'm on Telegram half the time just chatting because <laughs> it feels like I'm in like a co-working space. It's, it's pretty fun. So when I have a have trouble with Flowdesk uh, or whatever, then I have someone I can ask like, hey, how do you do this or that? 
And then we start talking about other things that we're doing. Oh, I'm starting an Instagram challenge. I want to do an Instagram challenge. Let's do it. You know, just that, that, that's really just the process. Now, what's scary is I always have in the back of my head, like, how long is this going to last? Am I going to be able to hold this up? So that's actually what keeps me from jumping into a lot of things because I don't want to add more and more and more. Uh, I want to try things out and I want to be playful about it. But um, yeah, I I am very much in a season of let's shed all the little things that just keep getting on the list that aren't really moving the needle forward or making me feel excited anymore. So that's what being in your 40s does, I suppose. <laughs> I'm almost out of my 40s. So I'm I'm with I thought there was a good decade. So I'm I'm glad I anyway, I turned 50 in April. Um, Woo! I know I'm excited. It keeps getting You're better. April Fool, aren't you? No, I'm not April Fools, but my friend Demi <laughs> is. Um, OK, so um, I'm looking at the time. So uh, I'm trying to see which ones I want to skip. Um, there okay. were a lot of questions. There were. Dating. There were a lot. Okay. You can take a minute. Well, I think that some of them are like repeats. So, okay. So looking back, have you found, I hope you have an answer for this one. Um, Have you realized or found uh, like a superpower because you've had time that you've been doing things you can like, Oh, I'm good at blank or I'm um, has there been something that you've realized? So, I feel like I can answer that question in different ways. Are we talking about like you can art, however, business, you... personal, Both. any of them? <laughs> okay, okay, answer it for art, and then I'll okay. ask you about another one. Oh, okay, okay, we'll do more than one. Cool. Um, with art, you know, people say I'm really good at color, but it's I kind of feel like I just stick to the same ones. <laughs> <laughs> and then just wiggle a little bit from, well, you know, left to right. But uh, I would say that I am good at one of my superpowers is in letting it be what it is. I think a, a big reason why people join Watercolor Bold is because they want to have a voice in their head similar to mine that says, oh, well, that didn't turn out the way I wanted to. All right. And we move on and we keep going. I think that that's odd of me and likely refreshing to someone who's feeling like, Ugh, I'm so I'm struggling, but I really, really believe that whatever comes out was meant to be my initial idea of what this piece was supposed to look like is not the end all be all. So many times we, live our life thinking we know exactly what the right move is and we don't get to do that move. And we had five other ones that ended up being better. So I don't, as much as I trust my, my intuition or my gut, I also really trust that it is what it's meant to be in the end. So. Okay. I like that. So does that apply to business or life as well? Superpower wise? Uh, yeah. Or is there another one sure. you want to share? I actually think I'm more intentional with business, probably because I, probably in a negative way, because I feel like I need to figure it out and control or else mm. the thing's going to fall apart, you know? So I haven't grown to that level of trust as I have with painting. With business, I I would say that Again, for, for being a quiet girl, I, I, yeah, my superpower surprisingly to me is networking. So I'll, I love to hear or be in one conversation and think of someone and bring them into it and, you know, work in all the ways. Uh, I remember that first surtex I did where we were in these small areas that I called the lemonade stands. Um, I would have somebody looking through my stuff that was looking for something that I knew wasn't there. And I was, I would tell them, you know, Oh, you, you need to go see that guy over there across the way. And it was so much more rewarding to watch that connection happen 
than to have that person's business card and try to mold myself into whatever mm. it was that they wanted me to be. So just kind of networking in a way. I don't know. Cause I will never go to a networking event where I'm just standing around with a cocktail in my hand, but uh, <laughs> unless I already have a network with me, that's how I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love that. I love that. Um, so when you're, um, I know you have those boards and I think the other thing that you talked about in the class, I think was that you normally work a certain size, like a nine by 12, but those boards were significantly larger. So mm -hmm. working in, so I am very uncomfortable working larger, very uncomfortable. And, but maybe that is being uncomfortable, something that helps you to, um, break out of or yeah is there yeah. is there any other thing that you've kind of found that you're like oh so working larger than you normally do or working in a different method or like you tried the ipad and you were like this does not work i mean i think yeah. it's good that you tried you know this morning i was working on the ipad actually but it's just more of like oh, this client wants these little changes or like little outlines on the flowers in another color. It's, it's done. I'll just add it in digitally. So I'll do that. But um, when I, when I feel uncomfortable, for sure, there's, there's work that can happen there. I think it's just for one, I mean, just real quick for you, Diane, working larger just means you need to stand up. So you're not going to be using your wrist. You're going to be using your elbow. Uh, but, you know, let's say you do that first semicircle arch. Like that paper is either ruined or like on its way to greatness, right? So it's your choice to leave it like that or to keep going. And you're going to keep going, right? So it's always that first splatter. Like sometimes you just have to ruin something like in your mind, feel like you are ruining it to, to really make yourself break through that. Um, with, with, uh, let's say something more literal, right? So it's not fair that we're talking so much about non-objective stuff, but if I were trying to make, um, a horse, you know, standing up on its hind legs, like a unicorn or whatever, uh, then, I would just do a quick stroke of the arch of its back. And then you're just committed. You're like, okay, now I got to see this thing through. So it's really just the starting, right? And then the other thing is that three quarters of the way in, you completely expect, or halfway through, you expect it to suck, to look horrible. And you either push through that or you let it go, depending on how emotionally stable you feel at that point. <laughs> and then you come back to it, right? Because... Nine times out of 10, what you think looks horrible when you're just about done looks great the next morning or not that bad. Um, and then you know exactly what to do for it. Yeah, I love that. Okay. Um, I, I always stand up almost. I mean, I oh. guess I, so my table is, I can't sit down because there's too much stuff in my chair. So I am always standing up. I don't think I've sat in that chair in like three years. Um, but I think when I'm sitting at my desk at work or something and I'm drawing, it is tighter. So I also think using chunky tools helps mm -hmm. me to be a little looser. I'm definitely, um, it, it's something I'm having to, it's with watercolor or with something that's water soluble or something that you just can't control. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just have to make a whole lot of yuck and then just see. And there's always my my thing is there's always another side of that piece of paper. You can always turn it over. I've cut up many, many <laughs> sheets of paper. Um, so do you have any other creative outlets or maybe non-creative outlets um, that you do to keep you balanced? Yeah, it seems a little unfair because it's not necessarily what. I, I don't know. I, OK, I, I don't quite know how to express like I think just being a mom takes up a lot of my time <laughs> but uh I like roller skating but we don't have a rink where we live so 
it's a very special thing to drive to a roller skating rink. And I love the ocean, but we live in Minnesota and I don't care how many lakes we have. It's just not the ocean. <laughs> so I, uh, I think I, I just, I hold up these, these like bottle up these like ambitions for these little trips. Um, I like to travel or just try something different. Just realize like you could live anywhere. What, it, what would it be like here? So that's one thing, but something that I've noticed as a thread is that a lot of the things that I enjoy as outlets, including artistic ones are ones that make me feel like a kid again, mm. that remind me of, you know, young Amaryllis. And so roller skating with, you know, disco balls, which I have a few of in here and, <laughs> and rainbows and rainbow bright and all those things, like all those things really do feed me. Uh, the ocean does because it's, it's a memory for me. I'm Puerto Rican and, and the ocean's just a big deal. It's just a big part of that. So if, if I ever wonder what to do to kind of ignite that creativity again, I have to think about what I did as a kid and I'll probably get somewhere close in the ballpark. Okay. I love that. Um, and that's good to know about roller skating. I always thought my parents didn't love me because we didn't have a trampoline. So when I was 30, I taught an extra class and I made $100, $120. And that's what a trampoline cost at that point. And I got a trampoline and I was 30 and it was the best. Yeah. I still love it's dead. You know, they don't live forever. Um, yeah. Okay. So I want to ask you about spoon flour. So what was, what was the holdup for you getting on spoon flour, spoon flour before and or was it just not made that way? Like, is that something new that they offered? Yeah, I I started creating patterns and I wasn't very good at it for a while. So that's part of it. <laughs> but I I did ha or I have a company. OK, I, I had a company that I licensed my designs to. Um, I've since gone with a, a different company, which I'm excited about. But at any rate, when I started noticing all the designs they weren't selecting, I was kind of like, I want these to live mm. somewhere, you know? So I just made a home for them on Spoonflower. And I, I better understood through that licensing partner what a collection is and how, how things sell together, how they need to match together, particularly for quilting or coordinating for... Oh, just about anything that you sew, it, you're going to need more than one piece of fabric, one design. And, and so it became my little place to mess around with those ideas. I was, I met, um, who was the community director at that time from Spoonflower at a trade show. And she said, you know, they were just going to every single table, to be honest. And saying you should put your stuff on spoon flour, you should put your stuff on spoon flour because they want to have better uh, talent pool in there. And I didn't feel ready, but when I did, I did finally email her and asked if there was like basically any benefit to knowing her, <laughs> having her email address. Like, is there anything you can help me with? Like, any tips or ideas? And she directed me to a couple of places, but she also said that she would uh, bump me into artist or designer status, which means that you can start selling on spoon flour. So if you are able to approach and then validate that, hey, you know, I'm not just putzing around and throwing things out there to see how it works. Like I, I have some designs. Uh, there is there's no harm in directly contacting someone. I often and I can think of at least a handful of times where I started a project and I had a client in mind, but I didn't have a relationship with them. And then I just went on their website and hit the contact form. It's someone's job to direct contact form emails to the right person. So it's not going nowhere. There's no guarantee you'll hear back. But I've been surprised that I have heard back a lot of the times when I throw out an artist submission or even a hey, do you collaborate with artists? I'm having this workshop and I'd love to know if you would be interested in being a sponsor. I mean, just making that ask uh, has been so huge. 
uh, and it doesn't get old. Like it, it's a useful <laughs> tip, no matter where you're at or what you're trying to do. And that's a bit how it happened with spoon flour as well. I would also suggest that if starting a spoon flour shop to start with a splash, to not just do uh, a few designs. Um, with Etsy, I would say it's actually the opposite. I think with Etsy, doing one listing and perfecting all those tags and links and making sure that it's um, performing well, and then using that listing over and over again and changing it up as needed is a better strategy there. But with spoon flour, it's all about like seeing the collection, the assortment that goes together. So then the more you put up after you've gotten to that status, then you're able to use that as a, um, you give first dibs to whoever you're licensing with. And then if they don't pick something, then you can make additional um, patterns for to flush out the rest of that collection that you're mm -hmm. going to put on spoon flour. I love that. Okay, so in this last year, so this is taken instead of since 2017, what's the one thing that you've learned about yourself that's been the most impactful to your business or life? I got a lot more black and white about finances and what's going to keep moving my business forward. And so one thing that has helped me is... Um, Considering how much is coming in, if I get paid to give out the round number, $1,000, I know I'm paying myself $400. So I only think about 40% of what comes in. The other goes to tax, overhead, profit, whatever, uh, or next month, honestly. So that's one thing that I had to get really strict on myself about. Another thing that uh, has I've grown in this year or the last couple of years really has been annual planning. But I feel like this year I've really, I'm, I'm getting it a lot more. I, I like Trello, if you are any other Trello fans, uh, because I can see in a line, January, February, March, every month stacked up together. And I will even uh, color code different things and put them on the calendar that way. So I put in, you know, our family events and vacations. So I, I see them spaced out and then I put in my money makers, you know, like if this is going to happen this month, you know, and, and I have them grouped together or whatever, then that's going to be a problem. Like I need to continue and I also need to not get exhausted. And I also not need to exhaust the people who uh, are patrons. So what, what can I do in this time of the year that will help get me through the next three months or so and spacing those out. And it's been really beneficial for like even accepting engagements like this. And I, I know like this month I have this variety of things and next month I'll have more time, um, et cetera. And like I said, I really enjoy color coding things because being that I have different streams of income and it's not I don't want to be just in one lane for too long. I actually like jumping around lanes so I can see, okay, if licensing is pink on my Trello board, then I can see it peppered through and I can see the deadlines for the fabric collections that I need to create. And so I not only see that, you know, m the business is staying afloat, but that my creativity is also staying afloat and I'm not exhausted by, um, setting up the shop for Christmas or whatever, you know, those right. things that really burn us out. Like I am so against burnout that I will, I'll plan to death just trying to avoid that um, because I've been there and, and it's really hard to dig yourself out of it. Oh, for sure. Well, one last thing I wanted to, well, maybe two, but one was you have, you have these awesome ceramic, your patterns on these ceramics. So one is yeah. like, um, uh, kind of looks like a eucalyptus maybe, or it's these green leaves. And then one mm -hmm. is this um, just blue and white. I love that. That stuff is so awesome. Was that uh, something you'd always wanted to go on to ceramics? Oh, look, and she has it here for us. If you're watching. I um, love this. Yeah, these are, these are for Mikasa. Um, and it was 
really fun. Honestly, I I guess I it's it. cactus. Yes, it's a yeah. cactus. I painted these uh, while traveling. So uh, the kids were little and the grandparents took us on a Disney cruise. <laughs> I remember scanning with my handheld scanner, which really looks like a flat hair iron trying to scan it as slowly as I could across. Not that the boat wasn't slow enough, but it's really hard to get a good scan with those things. Yeah. Um, and this is that, that line was actually, it sold so well that they continued it and then just added a few extra pieces. Um, what I love about surface design and just really in design in general, since I'm coming from constantly painting and a lot of, times people think they need to have this stand up beautiful painting to do well but not with design with design you just need some elements that are well coordinated and well placed and so this design has just a bunch of spots that were brush markered um, but since they're irregular you know they're not the kind of thing you easily draw in illustrator then it's got just enough feel to it there's a, a cheetah on here and it has three colors. It's just yellow, black, and some blue as a mid-tone. So um, I'm just always blown away by the simplicity of design. It's probably my tendency of building up and tearing down, and building up and tearing down, and just watching how both can be beautiful. But those, those were uh, with a company actually in the UK. So they weren't available in the U S except through Amazon because somebody bought a bunch and then decided to, you know, resell. Uh, and I'd love to do some more. I'll keep you posted. I'll let you know, uh, I, because it's so fun to hold something in 3d like that. And it's different than fabric or different than not that fabric's not great or wallpaper or, um, uh, whatever the other thing is wrapping paper. But a lot of stationary. yeah, a lot of stationary, but there's some, when I saw, I was like, oh my gosh, that feels like your mom would see that in the, when she's shopping, you know, like, oh my gosh, my <laughs> daughter made that right. Like that's a, I don't know that it just, so seemed, now we have these at home and we, we can't use them because <laughs> I made them. <laughs> it's like, that's the sacred bowl. You can't use that bowl. It's my favorite bowl. I know yeah. they're well, they're beautiful. I, I, I really, I thought that was really neat. Um, what is this is the last question uh, besides the, what is next? What, what is one piece of advice you would give yourself six years ago? The Amaryllis from 2017. This sounds really mean towards myself, but I wish I would have just gotten smarter faster because I was putzing around. Like, I think this will work. And I don't know. And it's, we live in such a crazy time where we can find out anything we want to find out. And so if you're wondering, like, would this work? Like, go find out. Would it work? Like, and if it doesn't, if you can't figure it, if you can't find your answer, because what you're thinking I'm doing is just so rare and keeping you up at night, then do it. I think I, I just spent so much time, like, watching other people and trying to piece together the crumbs after their trails and, mm. and think, okay, if I just, if I just gather the right, the right bits of knowledge from looking at what they're doing, then I'll be in a good spot. But it's just like, life is just too fun. And, and the possibilities are so endless to just put up with that nonsense. So if it's skill you need, like go after that skill. Like if it's, I need to learn how to make repeat patterns that aren't just a grid then go after that. And, right. and, and that will lead you to the next thing. Or if it's, you know, inspiration you need, if you need to really understand who you are and what, what you have to offer the world, like you're not going to get that by scrolling Instagram. So we just, we have these things that we need to fix, patch up, move forward in. And we tend to not really address them <laughs> and just waiting like hope marketing, right? hoping that someone will discover me and, and lead the way yeah. I actually watched, uh, I didn't get to finish it. Uh, La La Land last night again, cause I, I was on a plane and, um, 
that's a really long movie. But anyway, the, the opening song is about like someone discovering me kind of, they're like in a, in a traffic jam and they're like, maybe this time somebody will, will find me, find my talent. And I remember thinking like, oh, I am so glad I don't live like that anymore. Mm. Um, I feel like we have so much more control. Well, I know we have so much more control over the steps we take and our destiny, so to speak, or who we meet or what direction we're going in than we want to admit. I think we want to give somebody else the responsibility of like, I was never discovered. I was never found or I never found the right spot. It's like you, you could. Um, And it's not going to be easy. I'm not meaning to make it super simplistic, but I was talking about the fabric companies. I enjoyed being with one fabric company for three years and now I am with Moda and it's one of the biggest names in quilting and it's, a huge difference, but I, I was trained for that opportunity. Right. And you see that, you see that all the time looking back. So, um, I guess, yeah, I'd get out of my head. I'd want to tell myself to just stop, you know, mulling around and just, you know, decide on one thing that you want to move forward. And what do I need to do to, to get to that point? So D ask a great, a great question. Why did I say it like that? I have no idea. Anyway, um, the, link- it. That's cute. <laughs> the link to your fabric. So I put the link to your website, which is watercolordevo.com. Her Insta- Instagram is the same. And her YouTube is also at Watercolor Devo. So and you can actually. Well, and on spoon. OK, great. I'll plop that one in. So, but, but you can actually get to Spoonflower from your watercolordevo.com. I bet you could. I think that's how I got there. Um, So, but, but you have products that you sell, you have um, links to Spoonflower, you have um, courses, there's, you have this one hub, which is your website. And then you also have a way for people to sign up for the tip Tuesday. And then there's Mm -hmm. also something for, uh, for a private showing, which sounds a little weird, but it doesn't for it, what we're talking about. Um, because that's how you're keeping some things. You're not sharing everything so that somebody either mm-hmm. so that you're getting people who are in licensing are able to look at it and see it first, which I think right. is really uh, it's a, that's a I thought I thought that was a really nice call to action. And it was very clear. Right. Yeah. Thanks. That's yeah. That's a, a private gallery for people who are our buyers and our directors that are licensing artwork. Uh, so you, you have to kind of validate your credentials a little bit with me, you know, tell me who you are, what company you're with. And I'll spit you the, the password to see more artwork. Yeah. But I love that. I love that there's, you have that. And then it does kind of give you that extra layer of, but it also helps the those people to know that you know what you're doing. So I hope you guys will sign up. Um, l- one last thing. You have the artist pro method. And I'm like the, <laughs> I never signed up for that because I was like pro. I'm definitely not a pro. Uh, right. So, so but yeah. pro stands for something else. So tell them about yeah. that because that's maybe one of the th- next things that's coming up. Um, tell sure. them what pro stands for. That's my annual course where, you know, around the year I am talking about art and painting. And only once a year I talk about how I do my business work, um, particularly how I do licensing. And um, it could be really, or Etsy shop, it's, it's really the process of taking your artwork and making it a polished something to market. And we go through that over six plus weeks, but pro is an acronym that stands for polish repeat output. So we polish the artwork so that it, I know so many times you photograph or you scan your art and you're just kind of like, Meh. Uh, I have a few tricks for making it look great because my biggest thing is I don't want to spend all my time at the computer. I want to get back to painting or I want to get back to some other area of my business. And so I, show how I do that quickly, especially the repeat patterns. I don't use um, the Photoshop plugin 
for creating patterns, pattern preview. Sometimes I will. It's not, I don't know. I, I like my method way better. It's actually, I find that it's faster and I can also create half drop repeats just as easily, which are so much more dynamic. Um, and so I teach that in the spring, like I said, it'll start in April and uh, it's a live class. We have uh, guest speakers and art directors come in and talk to us. Um, and each week we do something different where we're cleaning up the artwork we're creating re a basic repeat. Now we're going to create a, a conglomeration of repeats. And now we're going to explore all the different ways that we can market our art, um, be it through licensing, business to business kind of deals, or straight to consumer. I love that. Well, I'm not afraid anymore. So you'll see me there this <laughs> year. Um, Amber, let's just thank you so much. And you guys make sure you go. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, all the links are right at the top. Um, if you're listening on whatever you get your podcast, all the links are right at the top in the description. I picked up some playgrounds because oh, I feel like we've yeah. talked about them so much, but I need to head out myself. They're upside down, but um, my Moda fabrics aren't out yet. They'll be in December. And guess what they wanted to do? Playgrounds. So it's going to be a collection of playgrounds that in a way is just like my Lisa Frank dreams all come true. Ah, so that's excited. awesome. That is so awesome. I'm so excited for you. I can't wait to see what comes out in December. I will see you guys next week with Bethany Heck. And if you are interested in um, uh, volunteering at Creative South, I still have some volunteer tickets, which it's in uh, the end of March, March 29th, 30th or something. It's in Columbus, Georgia. And if you want to get the Blobs book is now available. Amaryllis, I'm going to send you one. So just um, send me your text me no I'm, I'm gonna buy it i'm gonna buy it i'm gonna find where diane sells these things i love it so much well i would love to send you one so anyway i will see you guys next week bethany heck amaryllis thank you so much and you guys have a great day you.